Hello and welcome to Beginning Middle End, the podcast where we talk to creators and story lovers about storytelling. Paintings were once the best and only way to capture a visual idea or moment. Less objective than a photograph, a painting interprets the world with each and every brushstroke. The American painter and illustrator Norman Rockwell could seemingly fit an entire life story in a single image. I'm Shane and painting is a passion of mine and stories are my favorite things in the world. Here to talk about it with me today is artist Heather Stadler. Heather's a painter living just outside of Seattle, Washington. She grew up in Las Vegas, getting her start as an artist by pausing and drawing from Disney's The Little Mermaid. She's done extensive training at the Gage Academy of Art. Her work has been exhibited all over San Francisco and Seattle. Welcome, Heather Stadler. Thank you. Thanks so much, Shane. So let's talk about story. Broadly speaking, what makes a good story? I think just if people can relate to it. And, or at least be moved by it or their mind opened to something they didn't think of before or notice before and kind of experience through somebody else's eyes, you know, a different story. And, and that's enriching. So as an artist, you have a particular challenge in that you need to tell a story with a single image. So what's your approach when you get an idea? How are you trying to tell that story? How are you trying to break it down into that one moment? And then also, because I know you like to do series, so what's the benefit of doing multiple images to express or further the same idea? Well, I think it's important to have a clear intention from the get-go and with a single image or series, I guess, be really open to, to the process and try and keep it simple because, you know, you never know what's going to happen really once you get started. And that's a beautiful part of it, I guess, that by being open, it, it just, it kind of becomes a surprise to you each step of the way. But you have something specific in mind, so like keep it simple. And what is the, the subject of this painting and how can I draw attention to it and kind of let that figure itself out along the way, whether it be by brush strokes or lines pointing there or the, or the colors or the contrast, you know, keeping your t- attention there. And sometimes you don't know how you're going to actually pull that off until you start doing it. And then uh, you got to figure it out, you know. So it's good to try and keep it simple, I think. <laughs> so I it doesn't get away know. from you, you know. I definitely know that process because a lot of my works started out as big purple messes and sometimes I didn't think I was going to be able to pull it off and then just slowly, slowly chipping away at it. When you approach something, are you developing the idea as you go or do you have something in mind? Do you have a vision that you're trying to get to? Yeah, I usually have a vision I'm trying to get to, but I I usually don't know how I'm going to get there. And it's definitely a chipping away at it kind of dialogue, kind of like literally a dialogue. I have this chair my dreaming chair, I call it, and it's right across from my easel. And I spend a lot of time just looking at the thing and I have a dialogue with it and just trying to listen and just be open to it tell me what it needs or wants. Because I don't know, you know. So you've got two paintings called Journey 1 and Journey 2. And these paintings feature monarch butterflies. The first painting seems like, let's, let's pull it up here. So the first painting on the left, the butterflies seem like they're leaving, flying away from the viewer into a heart-shaped portal. And then Journey 2, the second painting, they seem to be coming out towards the viewer into the natural world. So let's just talk about this, this series. How did you get this idea? And was it always meant to be two pictures? Did it start as one picture and then you had more to tell? Talk about uh, your process. Yeah, this this was actually, from the beginning, very clearly going to be, like, this idea of, like, going in and coming out. And it's about transformation and becoming something new. And so the, the second one was definitely harder. Like, how am I going to pull off um, the newness part of it? Like, going in, going within, you know, and feeling that it was easier for me to convey than, like, what would it look like than putting it out into the world and something to do with like a whole portal and going in and around was always the initial idea. These are oil paintings? <clears throat> they are. And how long did they take you start to finish? I didn't keep track of the hours for the first one, but I did for the second one and it took 113 hours. 
the wow. second one. So I imagine about the same for the first. I mean, the butterflies, I think, took me like three or four hours, probably each one. Yeah, people should see these up close because the depth and the bold, almost graphic rendering of the butterflies is really amazing. Did you, Wait. after painting so many butterflies for so long, did you feel like maybe I should do a third because now I can paint butterflies so well? Or was it? Yeah. There's going to be butterflies in this whole series, not like that many in one painting, but like some form of, of metamorphosis of, of the butterfly in this whole series that's kind of based on transformation and detachment and self-awareness. And the monarch migration is such a crazy phenomenon. It only happens like in uh, here in North America down to Mexico, basically, or California. They, there's an eastern set and a western set, and one goes to Mexico and one goes to California. But millions of butterflies gather from all over Northern America and go to these certain mountain region in Mexico. And it takes like three or four generations to get there. So they all keep becoming butterflies and having eggs. And then those become the caterpillars and and then the butterflies and they die. And then it just keeps going until they finally get there. And then they go back and they do it again. And so that metaphor really is what like those two paintings are about specifically is transformation and and letting something die, like an attachment or an old belief to become something new. And then you don't need something from the outside to to make you feel validated or loved or okay. Then you, once you, you kind of go back to self and you have like something to offer, you know, then you, you can put it out into the world and then, but then you have to do it all again because then you're in a different situation. And, and so this is just um, life. And it's, it was a good reminder for me, going through like a very personal transformation and it held true during that year as I made them for like everything that I went through and and I think it's it's relatable to to everyone in every situation I hope it is anyways and and kind of acts as a reminder to just go back to to the self and be be that strong tree that whatever it is comes in and you got to let it go so you can come out kind of better and stronger on the other side. You know, it's hard to explain. <laughs> no, it's, it's great ideas and, and really powerful message. Did you learn about butterflies beforehand or did you have to do all this research in the process? I do tend to do like a lot of research when I'm putting stuff in my paintings because I want to know that it's authentic and I know it empowers me to go forward with the idea when I know that there's some genuine birth to it you know and so of course I know about butterflies and caterpillars and and chrysalis and and the butterfly hatching but like I didn't know about that whole huge migration actually with the monarchs and they're the only butterfly that does that and I I definitely yeah studied that a little bit and the more I studied it the more I was like wow this is so perfect for this idea because the constant multi-generational thing and they do it again and again and and that's what life is all about and that they're kind of going extinct, which is sad. And society today is also kind of going extinct, this idea of just going back to self and, and asking yourself, what am I doing? And how am I responsible for this situation? What could I do better? And holding yourself accountable for being your best self and, and doing the right thing and just doing your own self-work and letting go of whatever you need to let go of so you can show up better in the world. And, and have something to offer other people. Now, you've got another series that features a lot of ocean animals. You grew up in the desert, so is, <laughs> yeah. that, a, is that a reaction to, to not having water? Or talk about where you're coming from with your, your ocean series. Yeah, I always felt like I was a mermaid that was stuck in the desert. I, I really did always feel like that growing up. Like, I love the ocean. I love it so much. It's my favorite place to be just near near any ocean anywhere. And I'm very passionate about about it and taking care of it. And, and I'm sure that has a lot to do with why I live um, in the Pacific Northwest now and in, in Seattle. Because I just, I, I really just need to be surrounded by water. I love being by the water all the time. And being here for sure inspired that series. And it's easy to forget about the ocean and, and the perils that it faces when you live in the desert or when it's not in your face all the time. And being here, it's just everywhere. And I can't not think about it and, and worry about it all the time. I love it. And I love all the animals in there. And I see them all the time. The first painting of that series is a seal. 
And there was one day and I was walking along the water and I wanted to paint something. I didn't know what to paint. And I just was like, ah, what, what, what should I paint? Ocean. And this seal came up breathing and I could hear it. It's just so special when you see the sea animals. And I see them all the time, like jellyfish and starfish and lots of seals and sea lions and a lot of orcas around here. You know, and it's just so real. They're really here. We got to we got to protect them and help them. And so, so that series was really about this. Hey, everybody, we we need your help to just be aware of these guys and do your part. It matters. It all comes, comes back around, you know. And you live on a peninsula, so you're literally surrounded by water now. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so one, yeah. thing I, one thing I noticed, especially about your ocean animal series, is there's a lot of composition based on the rule of thirds. I see a lot of graphical elements on the on the third line and a lot of your yeah. your framing. Talk about how you approach composition. Are you a big fan of rule of thirds? Is it accidental or No, totally. Like if there's one thing I remember from the sort of limited art school that I did is the rule of thirds. And I almost always I always consult that rule when I'm making something first and see if and how I can use it. And yeah, it's a good rule. When you've had to abandon that rule in favor of something that you, it's just not matching your vision. Well, yes. And sometimes it doesn't work out. It's specifically like this one behind me, this, this journey one, like the hole where the butterflies are coming out. It just needs to be two or three inches higher and it'll be right back there in the sweet spot. And I didn't, notice that until the painting was finished and I was like oh I can't even handle that it's not in the sweet spot I'm gonna have to do the whole tree over and it bothered me so much and I had to get a hold of myself and and say it's fine it's it's just a rule and you know you have some other sweet spots filled so it's fine but I, I still think that painting would be better if if the hole was a little in yeah, that's, that, in that that's one problem yeah. I had as a painter is it feels like work is never done. There's always something that I could see, like maybe if I just changed that or maybe if I just did this or I could paint that so much better now. So I had a hard time letting go of, of things and just letting them be done. Now, yeah. the, uh, the journey one and two are a diptych, but they don't have a strong color relation because one is the inside and one is the outside. Talk about how you use color in your paintings. Well, I thought that was very important about those two paintings, and I really tried to work that in there by using, like, the same color pink that's in the background of the, the first one is, like, the same shade of pink that's in the, in the hole. So it looks like they're coming out of the same atmosphere that they kind of went into, you know, which is, like, a, uh, just an ethereal kind of mood sort of but and then the same shade of blue in the like little landscape that's inside the first one is the same blue so like I tried to to work with that because they are very different color but then at least they're kind of like complementary colors with the pink and green so is that what you're asking about like color yeah just how you your, your general thoughts on color like do you since you do oil paintings do you have a do you start with an underpainting where you kind of get your values set or do you just go for it? Yeah, definitely always underpainting, which mm -hmm. I sometimes think is like really good. And sometimes I start painting it, you know, and like the underpainting was so much better than the, <laughs> you lose when I finish. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. And I think, how can I keep that or paint differently where it's not so technical and wrapped up in trying to get it like perfect that it becomes stagnant and there's a happy balance there that I don't know if I've really achieved it yet. Does the um, underpainting affect how the colors go on top? I think I saw one of your paintings in process looked like it had like a brown underpainting. Are you always using the same base colors for your underpainting? Kind of neutral? I just kind of shoot for the ballpark color that I think that thing's going to be. And, and it's always like really thin down, diluted paint. So it's kind of desaturated in that not nature already, but I, I try and like map out the colors for sure, knowing that they're going to kind of maybe get 
pushed up or, or desaturated or become more more opaque in the end, but it'll be that general color. Yeah, I always started with a purple underpainting and that gave me all kinds of troubles. Mm. So I don't recommend a purple underpainting. Yeah, well, I know like when I was going to gauge the, the Academy of Art in Seattle, I, I took a lot of portrait painting classes there. I was like really into portrait painting for a while and I still love painting portraits and I love like capturing human emotion and exploring like psychology of of people with their faces um not really doing any of that like lately but i want to do more of that with this next series but uh, for sure with like skin tones you know you start with like a, a neutral kind of underpainting and build it up from there this colorful stuff though it's just like kind of fun in that way just uh so talk about your color. favorite painting from another artist my favorite painting is the one that that I worked on in the class that I took with you when I was 19. And it's, and I discovered that artist when I discovered that painting and we did that project to, to copy a master painting. And you did Norman Rockwell and you rocked it so hard. I was like, wow, dang, that guy is a good painter. And, and, and I always remember, also I wanted to tell you this, I don't know if you'll remember this, but as I was like toiling away on my mermaid's pasty skin, and complaining about it and you're like just shut up and put some green in it do you remember that <laughs> you probably don't but that has always stuck with me i swear this whole you know yeah yeah it's been like 20 years i, I asked myself for some bad advice so i it wasn't i put some green in it and it helped it fixed it i think she's still a little pasty but um yeah put, just put some green in it. and and i do still kind of like run that through my mind sometimes but it's it's evolved into like just just shut up and do something different. Like just stop trying to do what's not working and try something else. Is it green? <laughs> try green first. But yeah, that was great advice. And and yeah, I love that guy, John William Waterhouse. I love his work and and that painting, The Mermaid, is to this day still my favorite painting. How does that painting make you feel? What is it that makes you that draws you to that image? Well, like maybe my inner mermaid, like She's sitting there and she's brushing her hair and she's got, and it's not like frilly. It's very natural, very natural scene. And she's, she's got this like big mollusk seashell full of pearls and she's just sitting there alone brushing her hair and she's just like la 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 and everything's fine. And she's got like a regular fish tail. It's like not a frilly, it's not frilly. It's, it's, it's like a straight up yeah, fish. It's not, it's not a pretty looking tail. <laughs> no. But it's so beautiful. It's just like this is what what it probably would look like in real life, and and what what it would be like if a mermaid came out of the water to brush her hair. She just sit on a rock with her fish tail, and in this beautiful cavern with little waves kind of lapping, and you can hear them in the painting. I swear, and it would just look like this. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, Waterhouse is a great artist. So besides, just add some green to it. What's some advice you wish you knew when you started? Yeah, I don't know. So that's a tough question. I I think it's kind of the other way around. That whole like beginner's mind thing is is so true. You know, now that I've been I've been painting for yeah a couple decades now. I still think some of my first stuff is some of my best stuff when I really didn't know what I was doing at all. And now I get really intimidated by color sometimes, and I'm like. I have too many colors and I don't know which one to use, which red. And uh, is this cool or is this a warm red? I just, I can't tell. And why can't I just have one red or at least one cool and one warm? And I get stuck in the weeds with it sometimes. And I remember first starting with that basic palette, I was just rocking that basic palette. It was just like pretty straightforward. You're warm and you're cool and, you know, use it accordingly. And, and it just seemed so much more simpler back then. <laughs> And <laughs> you've gotten to the age where you're overthinking everything. Yeah, I overthink things pretty much across the board, I think. So <laughs> it's no different with, with, with my painting. So when I can tell myself, just keep it simple, then it, it really, really helps sometimes. So you've tackled butterflies, mastered those, ocean animals, done, mermaid, <laughs> done, all your favorite things. But what's a subject you haven't tackled yet that you would like to get around to what's on your bucket list for painting so i guess yeah as, as i've gotten older maybe or now that i'm a mother i don't know why i care more about 
what's going on in the world today, maybe because it's just like crazy town in the world and you can't not care about it. These days, like going forward, I really want my, my work to be more relevant to real world stuff and apply to things that I'm passionate about and and kind of be a voice for, I don't know, it's like it's like a silent activism thing or something. I, I don't really know the answers and I'm not qualified to say what's right or wrong. Everything's so confusing and infuriating and all I can do is think about it, overthink it, I'm sure. But I this this next painting I'm working on is is kind of about what the heck is going on and what can we do, what can I do, what needs to be done. I'm just like exploring those themes. And instead of it just my work being about my favorite things, you know, mermaids and sea animals and butterflies, and that's all fine and great. And I will probably be using those things in my stuff going forward. But I, I do want it to have like a deeper message and and hold some, some real meaning and make a real impact. It's all self, self-discovery and it's trying to make sense of what's going on and, and trying to make sense of how I feel about things and make sense of where I stand and what I, where I'm at, you know, because like, I don't know that either. A lot of times always got to go back to self and, and be like, what can I do? What, what am I doing to make this situation better or worse? And then hopefully people will also ask themselves that, oh, maybe I should think about what I'm, <laughs> I'm doing and how I'm showing up and do I have anything to offer or am I just making things worse? You know, <laughs> like, uh, yeah. I think we're all trying to figure things out still. Yeah, it's really hard and there's still no answers, but everybody's, you know, doesn't help to get ugly about it and get angry about it. And and I find myself getting ugly and angry about things too. So, yeah. At least you're adding some beauty back into the world with your paintings. Yeah, and I want it to be in a beautiful way. Like that's, especially I want it to be, take take these ugly, confusing things and in a, in a beautiful, positive light, share them and everybody take a step back and let's look at this differently and maybe we can let it go and become something new and have a new idea, let, let the old belief go or let the old attachment of the thing that you're just like, I, I want to be right, I want to know the answer, I, I, I don't want to admit that I was wrong, but you know, if you, if you don't, and nobody goes anywhere and there's no moving forward and changing and life just demands that, right? <laughs> you can't not change and move on. Yeah. So that's definitely what my next painting is about. <laughs> oh, well, I can't wait to see it. And that's all well said. And I won't take up too much more of your time. So we'll, we'll get to the last question. What's your best piece of storytelling advice for somebody trying to tell a story with an image? I think you just got to be really honest with your art and you got to give it what it wants and you got to be brave about it. And if it says, I need more green and you're like, ah, oh, I might mess it up if I put more green in that. I don't know how to put more green or I don't know if I should say this in my painting because what will people think maybe, or just, I don't know, can I, can I pull it off with your paintings? Like I need this because it's, it's sitting right across from the room telling you and, and it will tell you. If you listen and you ask it what it needs or wants, that's how you get there. That's how I get there. I have my, my general idea in mind, but along the way, since I don't know what to do usually, I just let it tell me by like really trying to be honest and, and trying to be bold. I don't know if I can do that thing, but I'm going to do my best and try because you're telling me that that's what you need. Okay, I'll, I'll do my best. And then that's how it becomes a story and, you know, it's a story full of twists and turns and surprises because you're just being open to, to the story that it wants to be, I guess, and, and your own story. And yeah, just be open and honest. That's my best advice. That's great advice. Well, thanks so much for talking story with me today. You can find more about Heather's work at heatherstadler.com or follow her on Instagram at hstadler7. And always use more green. (laughs) Yeah, it'll get to there.
You're still here? I didn't think you'd make it this far. Like, comment, subscribe.